Well, good evening, Righteous Nation. It's great to be with you. I'm Dr. Roland Roberts, and I'm glad to welcome you to this uh, town hall. It's a very special night. Uh, we have a very special guest, and uh, and so we're going to be introducing him uh, to you shortly. One of the things I want to make sure that uh, everyone understands is those that we have uh, allowed into the Zoom, the live Zoom, uh, you are welcome to ask questions. Uh, in fact, there will be a time uh, closer to the end of the call and uh, the broadcast that you will be able to actually ask questions of our guest or me, and uh, we look forward to answering those for you. Uh, it's going to be a special night. I know we were looking at different ways to broadcast, and uh, it, you know, one of the times in uh, a few weeks ago, we had a, a, a cyber uh, attack during the call, and uh, so we had to end it, and then we restarted. And so there's just all kinds of uh, things you never know what you're going to encounter. But, uh, you know, for us, uh, we believe that righteousness exalts a nation, Proverbs 14, 34. Uh, it's not that we kind of decided that. That's not just a an ideology that we kind of pulled out that we thought sounds good and might work and, hey, let's try this. Uh, it's something that the one that ordained government as an authority on earth uh, has said that this is the way people and governments and citizens uh, can live the kind of life that our creator meant for us to live. And so uh, that is what Righteous Nation is about. And as president, I will do what's right by all people in all nations of the earth, and of course, American citizens. And we're going to have a lot to talk about that tonight. Uh, but I want to get right into some things. I want to, first of all, start with, uh, you know, there, it's been an interesting couple of weeks. Uh, and I want you to go ahead and mark your calendars for for April 11th, okay? Our The next Righteous Nation Town Hall will be on April 11th, and uh, we'll have a special guest, Ben Shetler, uh, will be joining me. He is the president of the Center for Truth in Love. So uh, it's going to be a phenomenal broadcast because he debates people of polar opposite ideologies and uh, travels around the, the world uh, in these in these settings. So uh, he has a firsthand look and he talks about things that's different. It's not a matter of being Republican or being Democrat. It's about being uh, biblical first. Um, and, uh, and, and when you look at everything from that perspective, it really changes uh, how you view politics. It, it changes how you view policy uh, because all of these things are intertwined. Uh, in fact, you know, we were growing up, people always said, don't talk about religion and politics. And when you get older, you realize those are the only two things worth talking about and discovering and uh, communicating with one another, dialoguing with one another about to expand your understanding of both. Uh, in fact, it is the naive, it is the ignorant, uh, it is the uneducated in these matters that actually allow tyranny to progress. And, uh, you know, this week, obviously, Trump came out with the Trump Bible um, and uh, includes some of our founding documents in there. Uh, the same week that he's dealing with Stormy Daniels, you know, court cases, um, a bit ironic. And, uh, you know, uh, so many people have asked my thoughts on it. I can tell you, you know, it's especially from a righteous nation perspective and a, and a, a, a ardent follower of Jesus Christ. My, my initial reaction was the verse in Proverbs that says um, a parable in a fool's mouth is like a pearl in a swine's snout. Uh, so it's like that's the right thing, but it's really odd with him holding it. <laughs> and uh, and so that was my first thought. But, you know, really where I come down to it, and, and, you know, some have believed that it's blasphemous. Um, 
because it is obviously purely for profit. Many of the other versions that have uh, that are out there, such as Matthew Henry's commentary, um, Alfred Barnes, you know, has a commentary series. Uh, the Matthew Henry Study Bible is the one I, I just alluded to. There are others that are that are like that. Uh, that so individuals that came out with it, but it was not for uh, commerce. It was not to uh, make sales. It was as a study guide to go with it. And they were men of God, that, men of faith that had, you know, storied lives in the faith. Um, so that is what's, you know, traditional. And, uh, but where I come down on it is I'm not casting judgment uh, on any of it because I don't know uh, his heart. I know the way it sat with me, but I can't cast judgment on it. And I come down on it by saying, I'm just glad that a whole bunch of people uh, who probably otherwise either don't have a Bible or haven't touched one in a long time might actually touch it of his followers uh, uh, because he's promoting it and put his name on it, uh, attached his name to it. And I can tell you the 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 disciples of Jesus Christ aren't going to rush out and buy a Trump Bible, right? Because we have our own and we mark it up and we it's it's we know where things are and um, that's not what it's about to us. So I think the people that it will appeal to most are those that uh, you know might not be as familiar with with that. So uh, I think it's uh, that's where I come come on it. But there's so many different issues. I mean, you, obviously, there's many things going with Ukraine, many things going with Israel uh, and the terrorist attack uh, in Russia uh, since we were last at our last town hall. And then also the, um, you know, the cargo ship uh, at the Francis Scott Key Bridge, taking that uh, key commercial corridor out Um and what that's going to do, obviously, to traffic, it's going to take several years to rebuild uh, that bridge. I mean, it, it's not a small thing. And, of course, there's a lot of chatter about that. Uh, there's a lot of chatter about the solar eclipse coming up. And why would, for a few minutes of a solar eclipse that happens, you know, regularly, uh, why now do we need to cancel school and stock up on food and uh, our cell phones may go out? And so there's just so many things that are going on. And so I want to bring Jason uh, uh, Cisneros on to the platform, and uh, he and I are going to talk about these matters tonight uh, and what it is to be a righteous nation and the future of America and what do we need. And uh, I just want to introduce our guest to you tonight because Jason is a highly accomplished businessman. Uh, I've been able to spend some time uh, getting to know his heart, uh, both in business uh, and for America. Uh, and for people, just humanity. Uh, he has spoken on a number of, of uh, patriotic stages and uh, the Awaken America tour and, and others. Uh, he, is, he speaks on business matters a lot. He has started and sold numerous companies. And, uh, and so we're really glad to have him tonight. He does a lot in the humanitarian space as well uh, and uh, in coaching and especially helping small uh, businesses. And so, uh, but he's a patriot. He, he, he loves God, fears God. And uh, so uh, we are going to bring him on tonight. So uh, Jason, we are, uh, go ahead and, and unmute and uh, we want to welcome you to the call. Good evening, brother. I'm excited about this call. I've been excited about it all day. Actually, uh, since, since it was announced, I was like, oh, this could be, who knows what's going to happen or what we're going right. to talk about, but it's, it's going to be fun. <laughs> right. Exactly. That's, that's what, uh, that, that's exactly what I knew. Getting us together in this kind of a forum, uh, the the I I said it is you you won't hear this kind of rhetoric, uh, dialogue or ideas on any mainstream or even alternative media. Uh, it's not being put out the kind of conversation I believe we'll have tonight. So I started off with a bunch of issues that are going, um, and let's just have a conversation. My two cents on this is that there's a lot of fear mongering going on. Uh, there are a lot of things that are, you know, scary. If you look at them, uh, if you want to use that word, uh, things that most people would be fearful of. 
because they're so vulnerable. They're vulnerable if they lose their paycheck. They're vulnerable if they, if they lose their health care. They're vulnerable if the hospitals don't have power and shut down. And they're vulnerable if the food supplies out. Uh, I mean, they, it, it throws the country in a panic. I've put out two weeks ago on the water crisis uh, that, that uh, the easiest way to destroy America is not to invade us, but to have a cyber uh, event on our water system, which already happened two weeks ago whenever I publicly said this can bring down America. Uh, and and uh, I, I've been talking for, for years on the electrical grid uh, since 2017 when I was doing cyber security. And then we were moving into artificial intelligent weapons uh, or defense systems and how, how countries or uh, rogue individuals could use nation states could attack the United States, specifically with our infrastructure. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why I think the cargo ship was, uh, is causing so much chatter. Uh, and, you know, the, the course and the uh, power going out a couple of times, knowing that the ship had issues. Um, so there's just a, a lot of things. What is your take on the fear mongering um, about all of these different issues? And is it fear mongering? Uh, or is it just flat out the scariest time in human history to be alive? I I have two very um, different takes on that. You know, is it a scary time? And, um, you know, and, and is it fear mongering? And, you know, the thing that I think we've connected the most on, um, you know, you, myself and Melody and, you know, the whole team has been uh, that we're following Christ. Yeah. And, um, one of the things that we do, um, uh, is we do undercover rescues of kids that are being trafficked in the sex trade. And so that's bulletproof vest and, you know, the whole shebang and been doing that for years and years and years. And, and so when we ask that question about fear, it's interesting because the, 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 the nexus of fear is you know, what if I die? Really? That's like the, that's the ultimate thing. How, what, what if I die? And, and as a Christian, you know, one that we have on our, um, on our rescue team, it's certain ministries, search, evangelize, rescue, and train. And we have this saying that you can't kill a dead man. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, because we're already dead to this world and, and we're excited for where we're going to go. We're not going to like speed our way to get there, <laughs> you know, yeah. or anything like that. But, but I think that there's a peace, you know, in, in following God and following Christ and, and understanding that, that all, all things, what I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a fresh Christian. So, you know, you'll have to forgive my, my, uh, Bible references. Sometimes they're off, but, but, uh, I think it was Romans eight twenty eight, right? Yeah. It, yeah. All, for things me, not all things work together for good. Yeah. They, they all work together. And so, then you switch over into, into my, my, my business mind and my historical mind. Um, and I, and you ask the question, you know, is it fear mongering or is it a scary time to be alive? What an amazing opportunity that we have. My business career was in turnarounds, right? What that meant was for those of you that don't know what a turnaround specialist does, a company is basically out of business and they're, they're throwing me as a last result, you know, last resort in to go in and fix it. And, and so I had an entire career built that wouldn't exist if there wasn't challenges. If every company was running perfectly well, I wouldn't have had an opportunity, right? And we live in the land of opportunity. We live in the land of, of the constitution. We live in the land of, uh, of justice and rule of law. And I know that that stuff's all being tested, but it's been tested all the way back since the very first time that would they put the they put the document on the table mm -hmm. and so i look at it with an air of excitement of excitement because there's going to be opportunities for people that didn't exist and wouldn't have existed if things were just going perfectly smoothly like a machine right and so i think that it's a great time it's a great time to be a christian because I believe people are going to eventually fall away. And I've seen it happen over and over and over. I give you lots of examples, but people fall away from the worldly pursuits because they know that they're empty. Right? I had that happen in my younger life where, you know, you chase the money and you chase the house and you chase all that stuff, but there, there's nothing at the end of it, but an empty hole. So well, I, that's so, what's been sold to people as the American dream, you know, consumerism. 
Uh, it, it's, it built, is. it's built. It's been the god of America, you know, consumerism and and money and power. Uh, I agree that it's it's not not only is it not the scariest time in human history. I think it's the most vibrant and the best time in human history to be alive. And to and in fact, I feel just unworthy to even be here at such a, a critical time of human history. It's really uh, we we have a responsibility. Uh, it's not just happenstance. And so I see not only tremendous opportunity. I think there is there are things that happen at this point that have not happened in all of human history that's coming to a head. Uh, so I view it as every passing day when they talk about whatever the the scary the boogeyman is of the day uh, that all the media outlets jump on, uh, I I view it as uh, it's going to happen more and more and more. In fact, some of the events, I, you, you know, it's it's almost not enough. Um, you know that this is not uh, the end. We are rapidly escalating uh, to a to a, a a massive black swan event or a a, a massive um, uh, incident, and. Uh, and most people aren't prepared right now. It's just kind of one off. And so collectively, it doesn't change anyone's behavior. Even with the ship, the cargo ship crashing a couple of days ago, it's not, you know, the average American is not shifting uh, their life and their way of life because of that. Uh, so even that, as much of a wake up call as that can be for, for many things, it's not enough to, to shift the country. So, uh, Elon Musk said about an hour ago that uh, the, he said the judicial system is broken. And I responded to him and I said, the executive branch is broken. The legislative branch is broken. And yes, the judicial branch is broken. So uh, as a how does America, with where the culture and society is, where the system is, but then what it's supposed to be with the way our founding documents laid out what the actual branches and the functions of government are supposed to be. And of course, you can start splicing up a bunch of individual issues and which ones are federal and which ones belong to the state. But what do you say with the, the three branches of government uh, seemingly being so dysfunctional? I, I look again, you go back to the to the founding document and I know there's a lot of chatter. Oh, it's it's outdated. And, then, you know, blah, blah, blah. It it leaves itself open for for the advancement of technology and time and all that other kind of stuff. That's a silly argument. But when you look at the base of what our Constitution is, it's an anti consolidation document. Because the founders, I believe in in their wisdom, realized that any time wealth or power can be consolidated, bad things happen because it's just historically true. Yeah. And so when you are, when you are, are not um, following the rules, if, if all we did was have, we, if we just formed, and I think you and I talked about this, if you just formed an enforcement task force that went into the, the, the laws that we have on the books and you enforce the laws that exist right now, you would transform this company or, or sorry, it is a company, but <laughs> this country, right? You would transform this country into it's a, a closer to at least maybe not all the way, but back into that, that anti-consolidation mindset, right? Mm -hmm. That's why there is three branches. That's why there is antitrust laws. That's why there are, um, you know, uh, um, social uh, uh, protections. That's you just go down the list and, and a military that is run by the, the civilian side there, you just go through all of the things. It's just, an, it's not, it's meant to keep power and wealth from consolidating. Right. And so now you switch over into, you know, what's going to happen. Like, again, I'll go back to my business references. We always had a saying that said, you have to let the pipe break where it broke, where it needs to break. You mm -hmm. can't, cause if you keep duct taping it, Right. Then what happens is eventually the whole the whole thing falls apart. And that may be what it is necessary. 
But our constitution and all of its wisdom allows for that as well. So there may be a complete uh, falling down. I still believe that we can pull it together. I still yeah. believe that we have enough people. And by the way, 80% of the people aren't going to participate. You look right. when we formed this country, How? what was the percentage of people that actually fought back and said, we're going to start our own uh, country over here? Yeah, there it was 3%. 3% yes. are the ones who stood up and said, we're we're taking this country and and others started coming on board and they got up to maybe 10 or 15 percent but it was a three percent that were hardcore right so that so that's what i look at i'm like i don't i don't really care i mean i see everything you know you go to all you have to do is go on social media to see the absolute lack of anybody reading anything or understanding anything they're just they're just mimickers of right. whatever their political party or their news station or whatever it is deep thought i would still say that it's probably three to five percent of this country and then of that three to five percent who are who are going to be willing to step up as you are right to run for president and to do something about it and to stand up in our own communities i, I understand not everybody can run for president but everybody can run for something, a local office. Everybody can start their own business to, to keep us to, to have the independent access to capital. Everybody can do something with what they have. And if that circle of people, that three to 5% of people say, you know what? No, no is a complete sentence. Right. Then you stop the nonsense. I don't feed into any of this stuff. I'm not fearful. I don't, you know, I'm, I, I'm not uh, panicking. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I've done things to prepare myself in, in case something happens. But I believe that we are in, in that next shift to where things are going to get better. Yes, mm -hmm. there's always upset. You go back through the history books. If you read it at all, there's, you know, there's a, a relative level of peace. And then things start to get too uh, consolidated the power and the wealth. And then that everybody else kind of wants in on that. So they shift those things around and then it gets consolidated again. And we're just in that, that place where people are like, no, there's too much power and there's too much wealth consolidated in the hands of too few people. Well, and, and that, we need to break two party that. system. You know, I mean, a lot of that, a lot of senators uh, and a, a handful of Congress people, but mainly the senators who are there longer and more established and more seasoned understand that the two-party system, uh, the problem is not the, that it's a two-party system. The problem is how corrupt the two parties have become, uh, like you said, with, with the concentration of power and money. And so, two, and, and by the way, the political parties are nothing more than companies. They are corporations, literally registered corporations. They're not government entities. So when you say I'm a Republican or a Democrat, that's like saying I'm an Amazon, uh, I'm an Apple user, right? I mean, you're you're just saying you are the consumer of one of these two companies, uh, and and people get it in their minds that that these are like a, a legal government arm, and nothing could be further from the truth. Which means, like every organization. There's a handful of people that control absolutely everything. And so uh, uh, that was actually one thing that helps me with Trump kicking, kind of pushing out the establishment RNC and putting his family, uh, you know, and, 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 his, and, and his former campaign staff as the, in the leadership because the establishment RNC was not supportive of me at all uh, because they could not control me uh, and they only want the safe people that they can control. So it didn't matter what the political party was. I wasn't going to be able to be controlled because I'm my own person. I have my platform. I have where who I am. Uh, my character is not tied to the, any political party. It's my character is my character. And so that's where we want people voting uh, for a person, not a party. Uh, and so, but, but not only do you have these two entities that will do absolutely anything to maintain power, even as we speak, you know, President Obama and President Biden flew to New York for uh, to meet up with pre uh, former President Clinton on a fundraiser that's supposed to raise $25 million, hard cash tonight. And uh, it'll be one of the largest in political history. 
Uh, and at the same time uh, that you have that concentration of power and money uh, just by a handful of people in a room uh, that that they tell you as president, as Democratic nominee or as Republican nominee, here's what you will advance. If you don't, here are the repercussions for not doing what we tell you to do. Um, now, that being said, yes, those both of those are absolutely horrific in what they've been, but they can become, uh, we don't have to scrap, throw out the baby with the bathwater. Uh, they're not irredeemable. Uh, some question how, but they're not irredeemable. Uh, they have, it takes good people uh, taking taking over. And that's why it's actually in my favor for Trump's team to have taken over because they are more, uh, they're, they're not as closed-minded with you have to be establishment and do exactly what we say. Uh, they appreciate kind of the business and the independent spirit and focusing on America and not just a handful of, of insiders, you know, positions. And by the way, most of the people who hold on to that power are very unqualified. Like if they, you would not hire them to be the CEO of your company. And yet they're running some of the biggest entities on earth because it's not, this goes, but this goes directly to what you were saying about the branches. Whenever I talked about the executive branch and the legislative branch, and the judicial branch, the parties put their people in administrations and it's not just the president the presidents the, the the parties are telling the president here's who you need to have uh and really pushing for certain people in certain places uh and then obviously in the bureaucratic side of the executive branch which most government agencies fall under the executive branch um especially the services side of what we know in the um the like FBI and law enforcement wings of things, Homeland Security. These are all under the executive branch, and um, and CIA, NSA, uh, and so much of what they do is controlled not by the executive branch, legislative branch, or judicial branch, even though that's who gave them birth. Uh, isn't it ironic that? We haven't retired one single government agency that was started be to solve a problem, and yet they're all still here uh, after however many decades. But be it shows, like the State Department, for example, the State Department, um, in conjunction with the CIA, probably wreaks more havoc on Earth than any other single entity, right? I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable where we, what we do to manipulate regimes, regime changes, individuals, like if we don't like a specific person, if we don't like, if something doesn't serve us in some part of the world, uh, there is not a place on earth our reach does not go. And, but I was so shocked whenever I was doing some, some work with uh, South Sudan on sanctions and uh, trying to lessen those and get some of them removed and so forth. And I remember being told it's not the State Department that you've got to work with. It's the NGOs. There's like three different CEOs that we need to put in a room in DC. When the president gets here, we'll put him in the room and we need to sit and just have a talk. Literally, the six, seven, eight of us. And that is how you get sanctions removed off of a nation. It had nothing to do with any government arm, any government branch. It was three of the largest NGOs in the world. Obviously, everybody knows who would qualify for those. And they dictate to the State Department what's happening on the ground in these places. When I was at the embassy in Juba, uh, South Sudan, this, the handful of State Department employees are not going you know, on a, on a on a safari all around Africa to see what is the state of things. But yet they're writing these lengthy reports on what's the state of things. They get 100% of their information from these NGOs who are out in the field doing humanitarian aid or whatever. And, uh, and the humanitarian folks, the NGOs, tell the State Department, 
here's what's happening. And then we write it up as if it's the gospel. Here's the problem. They are paid four times as much, both the State Department employees in those locations and the NGO employees are paid a multiple of their annual salary based on the threat level of the country. Okay, so South Sudan, they keep at a level four, the most dangerous place on earth. Why? Not because it's the most dangerous place on earth. It has improved so much over the last five years, I can't even begin to tell you. And yet, it's still a level four threat country. Why? Why? Well, it's because the moment they say it's level three, they're all taking a, a, a massive paycheck haircut. It's that back to exactly that 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 inherent greed or self-preservation uh, that you're talking about. So let's go back though to the to the three branches because you said something. If if they would enforce the laws that are on the books, part of the challenge is that's completely accurate. But the question is, how do you uniformly? Because if the judicial branch is broken. And, and let me just put in parentheses, I don't think the system is broken or the branches are broken. I think the system is broken. So th to your point, the founding, the, the, there's nothing wrong with the Constitution. We don't need a con con. We don't need to do it. That will hurt pe the very people that push for that because of their pet one or two issues. I promise you they're going to lose five or six issues that they thought were just a given. So anybody and everybody's going into a con con thinking and it never works out, uh, it, it would not work out well uh, for any side. They would all walk away disappointed, uh, and, and the country would not be better off for it. But the, the Constitution, the branches are absolutely, and the structure is right. It is the implementation of the system and what it has become that is so corrupt. And so the judicial branch uh, obviously is highly partisan and highly broke. You know, judges, when you run for office, you're not supposed to put what your political affiliation is because it's supposed to be a nonpartisan position. But what we've learned in America is there is no such thing as nonpartisan anymore. And if you say, hey, I'm not interested in any politics whatsoever, that still puts you in a certain bucket. Uh, so uh, the the who, so yes, if we enforce what's there, uh, it would radic radically change the country. But when the enforcement arm itself is so uh, inconsistent and partisan uh, or biased or prejudiced um, or where it's unequal justice and it's, and it's, and it's not just a one-to-one -one ratio in this people group or this people group or this for this versus that it's not even the elites, just the elites versus, you know, commoners. It's not race against race. It's all of these things in at different times in different places in different scenarios. And so how do you how do you well, first of all, it, for from my perspective as the as the the president of the, of the United States, uh, the three branches are supposed to be holding each other accountable, right? So the executive branch is supposed to be holding the other two accountable. The, the judicial branch is supposed to be holding the executive branch accountable so that we don't overstep and overreach our powers. And uh, the legislative branch is supposed to be doing the same thing. And obviously with power of the purse with Congress, uh, which is, but you can tell so many people ask me, even running for president, uh, well, how, do, how, how are you going to uh, lower the debt? How are you going to cut spending? Well, if I was running for Congress, uh, you know, then that's what I would be specifically working on. Uh, but the president does not have power of the purse. Now, there are things I can do to cut, uh, trim the debt, but Congress will spend every bit of savings that I put there and would hope that they would earmark those funds for debt reduction. But that is not uh, how it works. So when you have a system that the ones that are supposed to be safeguarding the third and the second and third, and each one's the checks and balances. When all three are corrupt, um, you have to have a very targeted approach to restoring all of it. But I do think everything rises and falls on leadership. And that's why I'm running for president to influence, like just exactly like you said, this conversation 
uh, to say what we need in the judicial branch, to say what we need in the legislative branch. Your thoughts? Well, you said a lot, and I want to, I want to, I want to de, I want to, I want to sort of deconstruct what, what I think the premise of of where you were going, and and um, if I if if I get off path, let me know. I have to always come back to fundamentals, right? Because we have to understand the rules of the game. You know, I look at it like a Lego box, right? The, the the challenge that we have right now is that a Lego box has a picture on the front of it that tells everybody what's being built, right? Everybody gets on the same page. Mm -hmm. Then you open it up and there's a set of instructions inside that tell you, and then there's a bunch of bags full of, you know, 7,522 pieces that you have to fit together, right? And, and so if I'm looking at America like a Lego box and, and, uh, and our founding fathers had a vision and it has continued to evolve throughout history, then what is the foundation that hasn't changed? And, and, and then if that law or that rule of the culture itself is not being applied, then you have to reverse engineer back to that piece working. Right. It's like, you know, you put together the thing and you go back and your yes. your uh, blackbeard ship is all wonky, like it happened with me and my son at three o'clock in the morning. Right. <laughs> you know, I was like, we have to follow the instructions to go back where it was broken. And so at the fundamental, the fundamental, this is my opinion. The fundamental belief is that if the Constitution is an anti-consolidation document that is meant to be enforced by the people. Okay. Not the president, mm -hmm. not the judicial branch, right. not the Congress, not, you know, not any of these people. It is meant for the P for the, for the individual. It's the greatest document since the Iroquois, uh, um, con you know, uh, Confederacy put together. Uh, I think that that has ever been written in the history of mankind to protect the one. Yes. No matter what they look like, no matter how much money they have, no matter what their 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 gender, no matter what their sexual, no matter what it is, it's to protect the one against the tyranny of the many. Mm -hmm. OK, and so in our system. We have we have been deluded, we have been um, lied to, we have been there's all kinds of things that I could say that have that have taken us out of that role. And we're talking about 330 million people here in the United States have completely forgotten that we are the ones that are in control of this country by law. Now, if that's the case, then what has happened is we have abdicated. This is a big word. We have abdicated our civic duty. We've abdicated it from being the lead and the voice and having a say and, and putting our opinions out there and making sure that the person actually represented us and what matters to us, the individual, or we run ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. So you can get into a lot of things that, that deter from that. Why would I ever want to run? Cause they're going to destroy me with every mistake I've ever made in my, my entire life. Mm -hmm. So they set, that's, that's exactly how a, 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 a mom, monarchy or an oligarchy or, or a tyrannical regime or a communist or a socialist regime is run. You destroy character rather than rewarding results. Okay. And we can see that on all sides of the party. We can see that everywhere right now, but <laughs> ultimately there has to be an awakening of saying, you know what? I, I, we have the leadership that we deserve. This is, this is the conversation I have to have with myself in the mirror. That's right. We have the leadership that we deserve right it's now. True. now. It's true because we've allowed it, right? Yeah. There's there's a, a defense of the law that's called belligerence, by the way, right? And and I studied, I, I went into a bunch of different um, uh, legal areas and I studied this concept of belligerence. And belligerence is when you are belligerently holding to the foundation of the law or the or the the uh, the, the 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 founding agreement hmm. between the people. And so if we were just all belligerent and said, you know what, y'all don't represent us anymore. You know, you guys are playing. So you have forgotten who you work for. There are, there are so many things. And if we get that foundational piece again, I, I have always been of the mind that if we hit a domino, it should knock down 45, you know, 46, 47, 48, hundred of them out of the way. 
And our big domino is for us to come together as a people and realize much like, I don't know if anybody gets a chance or has seen the movie, the last castle. Okay. The last castle with uh, Robert Redford. It's kind of an old movie, but it was about a, um, a retired, uh, uh, a guy that had broken the law in the military. It was a military prison. And the guy that was there, the, the, the warden didn't like him. And he said, well, let me show you how easy it is to control humans. And he took one of the basketballs off the court and that caused people to start hurting each other, punching each other, fighting. And we're being controlled from just like the warden because we're letting ourselves, Mm -hmm. our walls are all imaginary, right? They're all imaginary. We have been told so many lies that we started to believe them. Yeah. Everybody that's watching you, everybody that's listening, what we have to ask ourselves is what can I do? Not what will Dr. Roland do for us, not what what Trump will do for us, not what Biden, not whatever. What can I do to help, you know, enforce the laws of the land? Okay, and so and so once we fully understand that and we we stop abdicating and we actually take about and it's different. Everybody here's got different talents, which is what the makeup of America is. It's all of our talents coming together. It's all of our different opinions. It's all of our different backgrounds. It's all of our different experiences that come together. It's supposed to be a a melting pot that creates greater opportunity, not for ourselves, but for the future generation. Uh, Now you're talking, you're talking anti-American. Not really. uh, I'm being facetious (laughs) because what you're talking about is being selfless. That that's a foreign concept in America. Selfless. No, no, no. It's all about me, myself, and I. You know yeah. what they say, uh, get all you can, can all you get, and then sit on the can. Like, it's mine, and nobody's going to touch it. Uh, so when you're just talking about being selfless and thinking about future generations, it's like, what language is he speaking? Uh, I, I want to tell you, you also use the word engage. People, You were challenging people to engage. Uh, and I'm so thankful for all those that are and do, and even those that we allow to come into the Zoom and then broadcast out. But I'll tell you, um, we have been... in indoctrinated to that it is noble to not engage so people actually and and look jason i used to be one of them especially whenever i was ceo of of companies i thought i was above politics like those are all of the people who are just like scrambling and you desperate for a microphone and you know they whatever I, 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 even in those roles, did not understand the gravity. It seemed like a, a world that was just messy and the, n- there, there was no, nothing great to come of it. Uh, whereas I could build something great. I could build a great product. I could build something that everyone used uh, and, and, and put it out around the world. And so I thought I, that's how I can contribute. I actually thought it was noble to not engage, that you were above the fray and so when you're telling people to engage and to, and to mobilize, so many people, I think, were programmed because everyone in my circles were of that same mindset. But that has shifted. I mean, that was a decade ago. That has shifted. A, a lot of CEOs now are very political. And we saw that during COVID, which ones did what with policies, which ones, because politics, at some point, politics will force itself on every single person who says they don't want to engage, it will force itself on you. It'll force itself on you when we say, you cannot come out of your house because there's a lockdown. You cannot leave your house. You can't go to the grocery store. There's a pandemic in your city. We literally are going to block off and, and cardon off all the exit points and basically trap you. We've done it before in America. So make sure that that, you know, uh, thing does not leave that area, knowing that there are a lot of people in that area that are not yet infected. And those people are trying to get out. But because of the greater good, they will they will barricade and block that off and allow whatever is going to happen to happen just so that doesn't happen to the masses. So you said that with the engage and I just people have to engage. If you don't, you will be engaged. The problem is at that point, you have zero power, you have zero influence, and you could have been using that influence the whole time. Um, yeah. And, and, and I think the only way to do that is if you are selfless, because you have to be thinking about somebody other than yourself. If you're only thinking about yourself, then you're going to go boating tomorrow. 
You're going to go, you know, play a couple, couple of rounds of golf. You're going to go shopping. You're going to go do whatever. Uh, you know, you're going to live for retirement. You're going to, you know, hunt, fish, bike, RV, travel, whatever, you know, retirement looks like. And you're just building that nest egg so that you can do nothing. And it's all about pleasure. And, you know, I, I actually think that we have a lot of fun. I even, even running for president, uh, we've tried to make it enjoyable. Uh, it's not a drag. Uh, so I find pleasure in work. I find pleasure in purpose. Uh, and I think that might be part of the issue is so many Americans don't have a strong sense of purpose. So they find, they look for that purpose in entertainment. Their purpose is how do I live for the weekend? And most people do spend more time planning their Friday and Saturday nights than they do their life. But, and that's not the people that are here. You know no. what I mean? That's not there. And, and that's not the people that are going to change things and God bless them. I mean, I, you know, I, I, for whatever reason, you're just, people are just built different, you mm -hmm. know, and I can't judge anybody else for how they, they live their life or what they want to do. I know that I have a calling on my life to do with what I have, do what I can with what I have. Yeah. Right. And, and again, it comes down to, the, the, the infrastructure that we have is for liberty, um, justice, and prosperity, right? That's what the document says, liberty, justice, and prosperity. And so if you think about it from that perspective, prosperity has some cool things about it. Like it has some things where I don't have to worry about, you know, bombs dropping on me and I don't have to worry about starving to death and I don't have to worry about all those kind of things. But liberty is the freedom piece, right? That is the freedom for each and every one of us to challenge ourselves to do whatever it is. I'm in the business community, right? I'm, that's, that is my background. That's where I believe that I can add the, be, the, the most impact because it freed me from being a kid that grew up um, you know, adopted father went to prison for um, attempted murder of me and my mom when I was 17. I was dealing or delivering drugs when I was 12, beating people up at 16, you know, had some good people reach into my life and twist and turn my mindset to say, no, there's a set of rules that, that were set by men and women better than you, that if you follow them, there's going to be a different outcome besides prison and, or death. Mm -hmm. And so the business community for me has been, was the thing that set me free. And there's too, there's too little, you and I have talked about this every time we've spoken is that there's too little conversation about the tyranny of being broke. And mm, that means right, that the right. less opportunity that we have to be able to go out and start our own business, and it doesn't have to be a big business. You know, if you if you're doing really great at eighty thousand dollars a year, and you can create a business that creates that eighty thousand dollars, that means that you're not dependent on a multinational, unethical business like like Amazon telling you that you're worth eight dollars an hour, telling you when you can be sick and when you can spend time with your kids. You yeah. got freedom that cost you eighty thousand. You know, and then and then on the other hand, you can you can build. Uh, but you know, a hundred thousand dollars, two hundred thousand, whatever it is for you, that that is you, and biblical principles stacked together with the parable of the talents to fall in love with somebody else's outcome, and to take your excess and do good things with them, right? That is, that's biblical, you know. And if we say we're following the Bible, then what? You know, business is just one of them. I know that everybody's like, oh, it's easier to get through the again new, new Christian, <laughs> something about a camel getting through the eye of the needle, right. <laughs> and, and being rich and all that kind of stuff, but that's not what it means. Joy is joy is experienced in service, right? Joy is experienced in, in serving other people and, and constantly challenging ourselves to get better. And I think that's the promise of America. I, I don't think it's going to go away. We may go through some tumultuous times coming up, but I, but I believe that as long as we can remain independent through small business, the mid-sized companies, anytime you get over 499, you said the word CEO before. There's, there's a distinct line in CEOs of companies with 499 people or more and 499 and less, okay? 499 and less are tied to their communities. They can't be, there can't be racial issues. There can't be judge. They can't, there's nothing because they have to serve right. their people right. and they have to serve their employees. 
And if you don't do those two things, you are out of business. There is a natural progression of consequence for somebody that is, is not running their company biblically. What, they don't have to be a Christian. It's biblical principles right. that, that allow someone to be able to build something that can set them and their families free. And by the way, feed a lot of people. We got told, and I'll, I'll pass the mic back over to you, but we got told non-essential. There's 33 million small businesses in this country. And we got told all at once that we were non-essential. 60% of the GDP is done by those 33 million companies. 60% of the hiring is done by those companies or by, by those companies and, and the people that are, that have jobs. Nobody stood up for them. They didn't have anybody stand up for them. They had no uh, lobbyists. They had no special interests. They had nobody telling them that they could stay open. They just had to sit back and take it. Right. That's my fight. Those are my people. We're building a representative uh, um, group so that we that never happens to people again. Because if we lose our small and mid-sized companies, it, it's it's over. It's yeah. over. Every war Completely has been won and lost at the bank. Period. End of sentence. Absolutely. Without a doubt. And there's a group called Free Nation in Ukraine that is doing that exact same thing. Uh, I know I'm going to connect you, you all at some point. Um, but that's exactly uh, the fabric. And of course, because of everything they're going through, they understand uh, you know, many of the people who are on this this uh, broadcast are pro are entrepreneurs in their own respect. I mean, just I can look at the different people, and obviously, Dr. Melody uh, with Soul Script and and uh, Prince does different things. Darlene uh, it has a business, several businesses, right? Uh, a lot of she has her hands in all kinds of things. Um, and 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 Mark King, same thing. Uh, Stefan Wetzel is a trained, you know, John Maxwell leadership coach. And so he does, does things on, on his program. Uh, uh, Dr. Wilson, Marie Scott Wilson uh, does. I mean, there, but here's what I find about these entrepreneurs. Uh, they, and why you were talking about how, when you uh, focus on prosperity or, or business and helping people start businesses and promote and strengthen small business, how good that is for the country. One of the byproducts of that is you, you have to shift your thinking from a victim to a victor. You won't find entrepreneurs compared to the masses. Entrepreneurs, even if they're losing, even if they have failed, still don't have the degree of victim mentality they can't. They right. will go out of business. Like right. it's not. It's not like even a, an option to have survival. on the table. <laughs> I can't afford to. To right. To, I can't afford to think how I feel right now. Because, right. Because it'll end. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think. But you know, go back to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness uh, for all. You know, injustice for all. That's where I think so much of America has gotten off track because the the so many of the the best things about america we it stops being about for everyone it stops being about for all it started for being me. about for my people or yeah. it started being about for my uh uh people of my similar interest or the way they divide us about among all of the different issues um it was how do i take care of this group or how do i scratch their backs and how do i keep these people happy and and that's why i you know, I understand when people ask me, what are you specifically going to do for XYZ people group? I understand where they're coming from because number one, they have been indoctrinated to ask that. They've been indoctrinated to believe that they are either oppressed or that they uh, are somehow less than or that they are owed, they are entitled to something. Um, and I'm not even speaking race. I'm talking about even socially in business back, like you said, with the lockdowns, or excuse me, with uh, small businesses uh, and who was who was um, non-essential, necessary yeah. and non-essential. One of the does one of the outcomes that they temporarily achieved was if an if we ruin this is unbelievable that this kind of thinking would ever be in America, but this is what happens when two uh, parties control a government, uh, two corporations control a government. Uh, it's funny, you would not be happy and no, nobody in America would be okay if Amazon and Google ran America, but they're perfectly fine letting two other companies called Republican and Democrat run 
the, the government. Uh, but the, 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 for them to, because the, the, the goal was more government dependence, right? Because it's easier to control people that way uh, if they need you. And so if you take away their livelihood and then you come and we say, we'll give you 3000 or $5,000 or whatever the number is per month, and you have to do something, start a nonprofit, you know, contribute to society in some way, but we'll give you this. If you go hungry long enough, that will break the strongest of people, uh, especially if they have kids that can't eat uh, and, and that are struggling. And so when you shut down that backbone of America, and they, did, they didn't do this uh, not knowing that 66% of the yeah. people... We're, we're going to be affected negatively. They they, they knew this, <laughs> and but they also knew the 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 dependence that it would create among many. So uh, and the I, short term riches that it would make for them because they can inside trade legally for the few for the few yeah, exactly. exactly. My <laughs> point is we have to get back to for all. Yeah, for all. What Agreed. would a presidency look like if it was a presidency for all? if you are president for all, not what's just best for, in fact, what if the metric was, um, I will do what is best for Americans. Well, I can help this group. I can help this group. If, if how I help this group and this group, will how I help them bless all of America, because that's possible, but you have to do it a right way in that, in that way. So let's do this. I want to, uh, we're, we're almost uh, bumping up against the hour. I want to take questions from the floor I love, oh, I, I'm, I'm seeing through some of the comments. These are great. Uh, so uh, go ahead and unmute. Uh, it, it's, if you have a question, raise your hand um, or like on the on, on the software or just unmute. And uh, if you've got a question for me or for Jason. Prince Aminahu, absolutely welcome. Let me get, uh, we'll get, we'll get you added on here. I want you to, uh, what is your question? Yeah, good evening, Your Excellency, and to greetings to you, Mr. Jason. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to listen to great um, conversation. Uh, everything you have talked about, Your Excellency and Mr. Jason has talked about, also relates down to, you know, strengthening traditional family values, which is in your website, you know, one of your policies. It all starts from the beginning, you know, because what's going on at the moment is really you know, it's chaotic because America is no longer having a strong family value. So that's one of the challenges. And I believe that is already stated in your website, you know, in at www.rollerrobot for president's website. So um, my question to you, Mr. Jason, um, I can say that you're an entrepreneur, you're a big business um, strategist, which is quite interesting because, um, you know, you being around His Excellency, you know, is a good thing because, you um, these are one of the you are one of the great minds that can also give great advice, you know, to him if he becomes the president. So my question is um concerning um small businesses, you know, in America, you know, because I'm it's what I'm also interested in and I'm looking towards that. Um, you know, from your years of experience, um, if you're to advise um His Excellency Dr. Roland Roberts concerning uh the challenges small business is facing at the grassroots. So um, sh can you share your thoughts around what you've been able to observe over the years and how you think, you know, um, there can be some kind of strategic solutions to that? Thank you. Um, great question. And, and thank you. Um, my, my perspective, and we have spoken about it, my perspective on it, if you go back to and I, you know, again, I'm a, I'm a huge advocate of small to mid-sized companies changed my life has freed millions of people, but Take it a step bigger. Small and medi medi medium sized companies can only exist and have ever because you can judge the culture of a world, um, the working systems of a world of the whole world, not just the United States, by the abject poverty measurement. Okay. And for years and years and years, back to as long as they started recording it, there's been 90% living in abject poverty around the world. And then 
And uh, even at like 1776, they're like, oh, well, America changed that. No, it didn't. You know, because 1776 came and went, the abject poverty number was the same. And and I'm looking at this from a practical answer, Prince, is what does it do for the individual? And so 1890, there was the very first time in the history of mankind, a centralized government stood up to the consolidation of too much wealth because that wealth, you know, then went in, you know, you get, and it was the, the uh, Sherman Act of 1890. That changed the world, okay? It changed the world because what it did was it leveled the playing field so that somebody like Prince or Jason Cisneros or anybody that's here could just go, you know what? I've saved a couple hundred bucks. I'm gonna start my little online business. I'm gonna start uh, mopping floors. I'm gonna start cleaning toilets. I'm gonna start, you know, hanging roofing. I'm gonna start doing something. And I had this, I was entering onto the same playing field, not the same tools, but the same playing field that the big companies were on. And if I could innovate and if I could serve better and if I could produce a better product and if I could treat my employees better and if I could fall in love with the outcome of my customer better and if I could deliver higher and higher and I did all of those things and I learned finance and I learned all you know um, uh, operations and I learned sales, then I could become one of those big companies or reach a level of freedom for me and my family you know, that, that, that I was looking to achieve. And so that evolved, you know, further into 1914 to the Clayton act. And then the last real big, um, um, powerful swat at this was the Robinson, uh, Robinson Payton act in 1936. And all of that, you know, it's been since back then. So all, all, what I would advise and what I would say fundamentally is if we just reversed back to those three laws, it would flatten um, the hold that Amazon has. It would flatten the hold that that uh, Microsoft has. It would flatten the hold that Facebook has. It would flat. It would redistribute. It would it would be an anti consolidation move that would make it easier and more a more fair playing field for Prince and Jason and Darlene and whoever else is on here. Now, the culture because I know these people. I know people that are small business owners. The reason I love them is one of the things that Dr. Roland said was they, they, they're not victims. It's not that they haven't been a victim of things in their life. They haven't had bad things happen to them, but they're not allowing that to stop them. They're using it in a, in a lot of ways as fuel to go forward and succeed. So I would say if we just went back, we put antitrust laws to where they need to be that would re-level the playing field for, for people like us that wanted to start a small business. And I would say right now to small business owners, stop shopping at Amazon. Stop giving your money. You're literally putting a bullet in the gun of your enemy to shoot you with. Start finding it. I know it may be a little bit more expensive, but but buy less. You know what I mean? Don't go, you know, sacrifice a little bit. Uh, wear stuff a little bit longer. Drive that car a little bit. I did all of these things, by the way. I'm not telling people to do things that I still don't do to this day. And, and at the end of the day, find somebody in your local community that you can buy from, and then they can buy from you and we take it away. We, there doesn't have to be a shot fired. If the small and mid medium sized companies just started doing business with each other, that would change. It would take politics completely off the playing field. They wouldn't have to do anything because then we would all realize, yes, we're 60%. You've got lobbyists from a trillion dollar business called Apple. They're minuscule compared to us. They have a tiny little bit of the, of the, of the GDP. We have 60% of it. You're going to listen to the, how we do it. And because we're built and our companies are growing on biblical values, that will then supersede. People will then get, you know, they'll do well in their business and then they'll go to government. We'll stop attacking character and we'll start expecting results. We will re-inject our civic duty and it's all tied in my mind. And I know Dr. Roland has many other things to, to concern himself with, but this particular vertical, I believe in and of itself can change the world. I yeah, hope that answers your question. You know, it, it's a great response. I would say too, that, um, you know, the character of who we have in office now in the past and in the future will always be a reflection of the people, the character of the nation. Amen. Um, and when it comes to the businesses, 
many of the problems we face today is not because the system was broken. It's because government kept intervening in areas that constitutionally are not given to them, and it has created the mess of today. Um, and so I know you were talking about reverting to to the, some of the, the, the three big uh, laws that are on the books in, in terms of finance and, and business. And, uh, and and I just think, how, how do you go from that to this, from, from those years to, to where we are today? And it's because government kept changing it, not for all, but for preferential treatment mm -hmm. to friends, to cronies, to family, to in, uh, in groups, lobbyists. And uh, that's how, you know, 75, 80, 90 years later, uh, this is what it looks like when government uh, puts its fingers where it doesn't belong. And I'll say the problem is the very many of the places where government puts their fingers it doesn't belong are some of the major issues uh, or some of the issues that we uh, are talked about in politics today. And we actually are carrying on the very thing we're saying we wish government had stopped way back then. So a lot of, I think, uh, I, I from an educational perspective, it would be great if a lot of Americans looked in the mirror at to what, what they want us talking about, and then us say, no, we the people, this is what should be talked about. When you realize the major players in terms of media, politics, and business, all three are so merged together that uh, one does not move without quasi approval from the other. Uh, and obviously there's play in all of that. That's what creates the drama that Americans are addicted to. But uh, I think that's just a, a great way forward. Prince, you mentioned family. Uh, you know, if you had a strong family, if you had husbands and wives that stayed together again, if you had children who were raised in loving, nurturing homes, not being abused, uh, being cared for, uh, being educated, being loved, um, they are a lot less susceptible to so much of what is, uh, on the cultural side, what is destroying the fabric of our families. Uh, and by the way, when the family unit is tattered, business is affected, commerce is affected, every, it, it goes on down the line. I was talking with a billion dollar, uh, uh, an owner of a multi-billion dollar company recently uh, within the past week. And uh, he is uh, going through uh, a divorce. And, we, and, and, and I, I said, if I had started talking to you a few years ago and, and we were talking about your, your business, um, the problems you think you're having in business are not business problems. They're personal problems. Uh, and he was bringing that, wearing those. And it's not that he doesn't know how to build a business. I mean, he's built a multi-billion dollar business. He doesn't need me to help him with business ideas. Uh, what he needed was to, for someone to be able to see that what has you stumped right now in business is actually personal. And so it goes back to the family. Can you imagine that, uh, imagine a husband or a wife or even children going off to school and if things weren't right that morning, the child's going to have worse grades. They're, they're probably going to act out. They're more susceptible to bad behavior. Uh, you know, mom and dad go off to work. They're more susceptible to, you know, other partners. They're more susceptible to uh, anything uh, than the the chaos that they just left. Um, and so, and it's always lower production. Uh, I can't tell you, even whenever I was a leader at a, a Fortune 500 company, we were a multi-billion dollar publicly traded company. I was 24 years old at 1,500 employees, up to 1,500 employees by the time I was 28. And uh, so many, most of the people who found them found their way into my office because of issues, non-performance mostly. Uh, nine times out of 10 and maybe 10 times out of 10, it was related to something going on personally in their life. 
every time they would tell me what they're going through. And it never was, I don't have the right tools. I don't know what to say. I'm not closing enough deals because I don't have the right rebuttals. I don't have the right software. It was never, I don't have case studies and white papers. It never was about that. It was always, you know, I'm struggling with alcohol or I'm going, my wife and I are fighting or you know, my husband's abusive or it was some kind of a family problem. And that is what was affecting work, the workplace. And people already, there's studies of what, you know, mental health costs employers a year. There's studies on what, uh, it, but, but mental health would be solved with uh, strong families. See, so many of the problems, and Jason, this is like what we were talking about earlier, is so many of the problems society wants to solve is is the 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 limbs it's the it's it's the the fruit it's not the roots if you want to solve a problem you have to get it at the root and we just like to kind of you know peck off some of these other things and try to solve these problems in isolation instead of solving but you have a strong family you're going to solve mental health you're going to solve your the economy is going to soar by the way you're going to you're going to put a lot of healthcare uh practitioners out of business because your health is going to be improved because you've got some happy hormones going on and uh, you're getting, you're being hugged and it's creating all of these wonderful, you know, endorphins in you and all these other things uh, that allows you to be, allow you to be happy and productive, uh, which makes people want to buy from you, which makes people want to hire you, which makes you more prosperous. So uh, Prince, I appreciate you bringing up a family because so much of all of it goes back to having a strong family. Thank you. All right, who's next? Who else has a question for- I do have uh, a question, uh, Dr. Rowland. This is actually coming from Professor Robert Jarris, who just messaged me because he's having audio connection. This is for both, starting with Jason and you. Uh, his passion near dear to his heart is obviously education. So his question uh, to you, Jason, and then Dr. Rowland, we seem to be going backwards on education, academia being subsidized by the government yet not being focused on productivity, GDP, or contributing careers, and much less entrepreneurship or hand, being hands-on. Striving to create tangible benefits, can that focus, do you believe, be adjusted with our current structures? So I'll start with you, Jason. That's a wonderful question. Um, you know, again, coming back to the root, like that that's a theme that keeps coming up in, in, um, in our conversation. Um, I, I, because I've done so many turnarounds, it's not the structure because yes, I mean, there is some structural issues and, and whatnot, but it has, to, it's gotta be taken back down to where it broke in the first place. And so having people that are genuinely interested in falling in love with the outcome of a child's education, right? What is the, what should we be preparing them for? What should we be giving them as far as technology information? What should be, and, and keeping out of it, the control of the teacher's union and all the money and, you know, how much am I going to get on a kickback if I let this book company get it or whatever it is, it's driven by greed. If it's driven by outcome and, you know, going back to Prince's question about family, I mean, if, if everybody just went, you know, I'm going to fall in love with the outcome of my wife. I'm going to fall in love with the outcome of my husband. Right. And, and stay in love with it. It's the same principle as business. It's the same principle when it comes to education, we have to fall in love with the outcome of the children who we are supposed to be setting up to do better than us in life, rather than, than raping and pillaging all of their, the foundation for them in the, in their future, they're going to have to figure it out because we were all greedy, lazy, you know, uh, self-centered people that fell away from God. Right. So in my opinion, you could take any structure. It doesn't matter. It's the FBI, the DOJ, the, you could, you could take the, the education system. If you took it back down, if you started with a bunch of people that had the kids uh, uh, outcomes in mind and you said, here's what we needed to develop them for you take the system back down to where it's broken and you rebuild from there. That is you. That's the, that, that's the way that you use the least amount of resources and you don't actually have to upset the, the apple cart in order to do it. It could be a phased approach, but it all comes down. Dr. Roland has said it many times this evening is it comes back to leadership. 
is the are the people that are building the system and the processes and the education are they falling in love with the kids' outcome or are they falling in love with the outcome of their checkbook? Yep. Yep. Thank you. Great, great answer. Uh, who else? Who else? What other questions here as we close? This has been this has been great. Yeah, yeah, great questions. Um, I know. Darlene, why don't you share? Because I know you wear so many different hats, and uh, from a from a entrepreneur's perspective, how does it make you feel when you're working yourself to death all over the place, and other people maybe aren't working, but they want what you have or expect whatever you earn for yourself? I'm sorry, I couldn't really hear you that well. Um, okay. Could you ask me one more time? Yeah, sure. So obviously you're you're going everywhere doing- <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. That's fine, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm just having like technical. Oh, okay. No problem. No problem. We'll come back to you. Yes. We'll come back. Uh, who, who, who wants to take that? Because uh, uh, let us hear from someone that understands that challenge where you're working, you know, 18 hours a day, 20 hours a day. And, uh, you know, but yet there's the, the culture there's a strong tide. There's more people saying that's not the way to go than those who are on the other side saying, let's build something, let's create something. Uh, and by the way, that's my vision, even running for president, is I want to inspire a whole new generation of Americans to create, to, um, to, to uh, discover. Uh, I want breakthroughs in science. I want us to discover new periodical uh, periodic elements. Uh, I, I we know there is more gold uh, in the oceans. Uh, in fact, like four hundred forty trillion dollars worth of gold in our oceans. Uh, we know just of our periodic table, the the forty some elements in the ocean is enough to sustain ten times the amount of life that we have on Earth today. So when it comes to the population conversation. Um, and that's just what we know. Uh, we don't have it not yet discovered the best kind of materials to build homes and skyscrapers and, and buildings or, to, or we haven't discovered the best ways of transportation. Cars are so, you know, 1900, uh, 1910, right? Um, we, we, we're still stuck in the rail system of the 1800s. We, we have stifled innovation in America. And, and so I believe that we can inspire a new generation to create and to, um, uh, to really innovate. And I think that is, and by the way, not just products, not just the consumerism, but the infrastructure, actual societal issues like education, not just rethinking education, innovating education of the future. What will our school system look like in the year, you know, 2200? And and start, like you said, Jason, at the beginning of the call, reverse engineering, you know, what that ideal looks. And you're not going to be able to move that, but you have to have a vision. And what you don't hear in media or in political circles today is a vision. What you hear is a policy. What you hear are issues. What you don't hear is vision for America. So uh, thank you and God bless you all. Have a good night. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm good now. Oh, okay. Um, that's, that's, a good, that's a good closing statement. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Darlene. You want me to ask? I think questions? I'm ready to answer that question. Oh, okay. You know, I'm a marketing girl. So I think we need to like incentivize people to do so and like maybe focus less on incarceration or punishment and more incentivizing good work and, you know, figuring new ways out or figuring new business out or just opening business in general. 
um, maybe more people will be inclined to do so or, you know, be in the sciences, be in these kinds of things. You know, I hear a lot of complaints about athletic, athletics and like all of this getting the money in schools. So maybe we just need to shift our focus to something else and incentivize the people to do so. So, Jason, it's an interesting point. What I mean, if 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 I'm a student in school and I can, you know, if I if I bust my tail feathers for all these years and I go spend all this money at college, university and advanced degrees and I get to make, if I'm lucky, I find myself one hundred twenty or $150,000 a year job. They're going to fire me after a few years because they lay people off. And then we go to the to the next job and that's your life. Uh, or, you know, you can, uh, you know, try to get good at sports and uh, and make a few million bucks, uh, you know, when you're 18. What I mean, how, how does the incentive structure uh create the outcomes that we have today um it's a it's a it's a really great sort of um amalgamation of the problem uh because education i didn't graduate from high school so you know and i've been able to do some pretty incredible things but that was because i had my i had great mentors in my life i had great people to say jason what's your end game right and, and we don't, we don't think about that enough. We, we have people that do things again, we can't, I, I guess you, the, there's a saying that says that you can't legislate morality. Right. And, and so putting the right incentives in place takes great thinkers and great thinkers are not celebrated these days. Right. Because they're, they're, it's just all about how can I get mine and how can I get it right now? And so great thinkers coming together to say, like, I'll put, I'll give you a good example. Um, there was a, uh, I think he was a doctor too, Dr. Roland um, Edmondson or Amundsen that went down and he was like trying to get a bunch of people to go to uh, 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 um, investigate the South Pole at some point. And uh, they were like, you know, trying to incentivize them with money and they're just trying to get them to go down there. And finally he said, he put out an article one day and he said, um, you're probably going to starve to death. You might freeze to death. It's going to be miserable. You're going to have a, you know, it's going to be terrible, but if you succeed glory forever, because you're going to be the one, you know, that you're going to, your name is going to be in the history book. And the next day he had a line of people down the street to go basically for no pay. Right. And so the in incentivization of people, not my grandfather, on the other hand, used to have a saying that if you give somebody something for nothing, you make nothing out of somebody. And so if we are telling people we're here to make your path easier, that is that that destroys the very thing called pride, good pride, not it's the pride in overcoming. Right. That should be part of, that is part of the biblical challenge is that you got to overcome. You got to die to self. That takes a while. There, there is a time when you, when you, um, when you get to the other side of that, but, uh, but functionally, um, you know, figuring out where is the world going, right? What is that outer circle? And that's like your job as president, right? And, and people that should be in those positions of leadership should be our greatest thinkers, they shouldn't be our greatest campaigners. They shouldn't be our greatest one-liners. They shouldn't be our greatest, uh, you know, sports heroes or actors and actresses or, you know, whatever that may be. We should be our greatest thinkers. And, and, and then to be able to gather together other minds to say in this particular area, what's the, where are we headed, right? Where are we headed? What's our moonshot? What are, what's our moonshot for our generation? We don't have one. Right. You know, it's how do I get mine? How do I get it right now? So, so the idea, um, and I think I may have lost the spirit of the question, but I will tell you that people have a genuine, like if, 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 if I was to ask everybody here or anybody that, you know, what is your end game? What would you like to do with your life? And then just to make sure that there's educational paths to the, to make sure that there's ways that they can be trained, you know, and, and ethical business do this all the time with training programs. They want their people to be the best that they can possibly be because that is an, a, a net outcome to their bottom line. 
right? Big companies don't care. So well, everything I don't know if I answered the question or made it more. What you're saying is an antithesis to our current education system that wants to put out a specific product specifically for the purpose of not of them having a good life and not of them even being able to take care of themselves financially. Uh, or we would be teaching them investing in taxes and a number of other things. It is to put out a, a specific product that is capable of growing our GDP for the largest entities. That's that's what the mission of the Department of Education was whenever it started. That's why even a few years ago, a college, a public college came and said, if you will commit to hiring 10 or 15 students, we will create an entire bachelor program for whatever need your business needs for 10 or 15 hires. Are you kidding me? So that it, yeah. was, it was, it was silly. And I was like, I, that's when I really knew how far off track, you know, that, that, uh, that was, and you, you said it success is defined by differently by everyone. Uh, it, it, it looks different for them based on what their purpose is and what their end game is. Uh, and that's what re that's what defines so much of what is right for, you know, for so many people in that way. So yeah, great question. I want to take the last one here, which is uh, Madam Sof uh, Solia Gonzalez. Welcome to the floor. Kindly unmute and uh, ask your question. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Sophia Gonzalez. And my question is, in light of um, a lot of what we talked about in the beginning of the call, um, the different economic challenges that we're we're experiencing from the concerns of the solar eclipse um, signs that's happening as well. There's a lot of people that I know that are actually really worried about that. And then also the recent cargo ship incident in Baltimore that we discussed earlier. Um, what strategies do you have in place to insist or to um, assist ordinary citizens in preparing for whatever is to come? And then also additionally, um, what steps um, can individuals take to safeguard themselves for the future? That's, that's a great, great question. Thanks for asking. Uh, the first thing that that I can do as president is tell the truth. Um, and that is so rare because of several reasons. Number one, many believe that the American public as a whole can't handle the truth or some of the other systems that, as we know it, would not work. So in order to keep people living in this bubble, everything we tried to shatter tonight, but to keep people living in that, they can't tell them the truth or people will say, wait, stop, then why am I doing this over here? But they don't want you to stop doing that over there. So if they could tell you the truth and you just keep doing what you're doing and not as Jason was talking about, we the people taking back control of the government. Um, uh, the problem is if you knew people currently that are sleeping or not engaged would start to engage and they would not keep power. So just like any kind of an abusive person in a relationship, they lie, they manipulate to keep control. Uh, so I would start by telling the truth. Now, the reason I'm not afraid to tell the truth is because I'm not beholden to the people. Uh, I will say this because we are so far down a path in America that is more grave than most people understand. Uh, and it is held together by a thread. Uh, but Judge Napolitano was a, a, a week before Trump left office. Uh, they were speaking on the phone. And judge told him, uh, Trump, I'm disappointed. There's one thing that you have not done that you promised me personally and that you promised the American people you would do before you left office and you haven't done it. And he said, what is it? I'll make it. I'll do it. What? It, just tell me what it is. He said, you didn't tell us the truth. Uh, you didn't really uh, tell us the truth about what happened to JFK, the JFK assassination. And his... And Trump said, that's because if, if I said what they showed me, um, the system as we know it, you know, would not sustain. And so we know, and we, we know that 
our government and at least one other intelligence agency of another nation were involved in that assassination. Uh, but essentially, some would say that it is what really happened was that we haven't had an actual, well, I don't even want to get, get into that, um, because of, of the, the, the exact issue is that the people who are running the government isn't who we are told is running the government. Um, and a lot of that happened around that time. Uh, so when it comes to the solar eclipse, when it comes to the cargo ship, when it comes to water, uh, cyber attacks, when it comes to everybody's AT&T phone, you know, cutting off all at the same time and a, a day or two later, you know, certain other things going out because of upgrades. Um, people aren't dumb. You know, people may not know, but they know something's not right. They know uh, you're lying to us, to me. You're lying to us. And uh, I may not know the truth, but I know what you're saying is not it. And that's where I think more and more Americans, the point that they're getting to. Uh, the people who used to believe mainstream media, many of them are, are coming to those to that same conclusion. Many who used to trust doctors. And it's so sad because I wish we could trust all our newscasters. I wish we could trust all, you know, our, all the healthcare professionals. But they fired half the people uh, for not taking the vaccine and that's a personal preference if they did or not, but they, because of the mandate, many of them were forced to uh, resign or they were fired. And uh, ironically, a doctor in New Jersey, I, it was sent to me, I think a week or two ago. Uh, if you're, if as uh, he signs, does all the student, um, the athlete uh, physicals for the year. And he their doctor's office, one of the largest ones in New Jersey, will not give a clear physical a bill of health to be able to play sports if you have had the vaccine. So three years ago, you could not play on the varsity, basketball, travel teams, different things, unless you had the vaccine. Now, they're saying if you got it, you're not allowed to play at all. Because we're not we're not sure if you're going to fall down from a heart attack. It, do you see how opposite this is? What they make you do today is the very thing that you can't do everything you're wanting to do down the road. And so I think people are starting to. I mean, how many how many examples do you need before you at least have the wisdom and intelligence to question? I'm not saying I disagree. I'm just saying I'm I'm questioning. I'm asking questions. And I think questions are the answer. And the more Americans that ask questions, good ones like you just asked, will get, they'll get the answers. Everything is not a conspiracy, but so many things, um, you know, seem to be whenever the government, whenever this, the rule is that the government says it, it's probably the opposite. So if the government says it's not a cyber attack, it probably was a cyber attack. If they say we were attacked, uh, did a, a the, the Chinese did a cyber attack on our water. Uh, it probably was not the Chinese. Uh, it's very similar to what happened with the Nordstrom pipeline uh, when we blamed, uh, you know, we 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 helped we we sabotage. That. There's only one or one or two groups in the whole world who are capable of doing that, executing that kind of a mission, um, and uh, we're we're the main ones. <laughs> And yet we 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 are willing to sabotage things that even will hurt us a little bit to make someone else look bad to accomplish a bigger agenda that we have. And, and there's except we're seeing this, ladies and gentlemen, in every issue, in every segment of society. And we the people are just absolutely sick of it. So part of the solution 
and it is why I'm running for president. We need someone who will look the American people in the eye and say, I will do right by all Americans. And then I will do right by all people and nations of the earth. I don't know another candidate who can make that statement because the leading opponent uh, on the the platform party I'm running on um, will do what's right for him, not what's best for the American people, what's best for him, not what's best for people around the world. Right and wrong, you know, doesn't really enter the equation. That's not how he thinks. It's deals. And then on the other side, you know, it's not, uh, it's, there's a lot of control. He's being controlled uh, by, by the party, uh, by that corporation. And uh, so he's not free, not even free of conscience to do what is right by Americans. It's what is right by certain interests. So there is not a candidate that is standing up to run for president that is running on a very elementary, back to the beginning, like Jason, like you were saying, go back to where it was broken. Where it broke for me is, can we just agree, if you're in, in that seat, to do right by your own citizens? And if by a God's miracle, you take it a step further and then do right by everybody else in the world. Like, is that too much to ask? In today's political landscape, ladies and gentlemen, that is unheard of and is too much to ask. So, uh, Zavia, I completely agree with you. Um, there's a lot of things that don't add up, but I would also throw this out. All of these are good things to, to be aware and to mentally prepare so that you're not completely surprised or thrown off guard where most will be. At the same time, always look at for what for what they're not telling. If what happened, so, so when a cargo ship runs into that and that dominates the news, I'm looking for what I'm not hearing about because so much of what you will hear, sometimes it's, you know, they're all tragedies. But oftentimes they use a tragedy to create the distraction. It's the sleight of hand because we can pass bills. We can do other things. We can do things over in this part of the world because you're over here looking at China and Taiwan. Or we've yelled Russia and Ukraine for so long that you don't see what we're doing over here. Oh, you're getting tired of hearing about Russia and Ukraine? Let's talk about Israel and, and, and Palestine and Israel and the Gaza Strip. And let's, uh, let's stir that pot. But at the same time, we're doing things over here. So I instinctively look at many of these red herring events as what are they trying to distract us from? And that's I love uh, that. and, the fact that you distract have to, our yeah. distract our own eyes from watching a ship take a hard left into a, to a pillar. <laughs> right. And and and, and, and uh, have any power. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, and by Sophia, the way, Jason, yeah. that's exactly what we've talked about doing with uh with missiles uh because they're all, you know, computer guided missiles and so we want you know, hack into them uh and return to sender. Uh we can direct them because they're just a computer. So, yeah. yes, please. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? So Sophia, you had asked a question. I'm I'm a I'm a prepper. And so here's how I like to think about it. I like to think about it from the, the foundation of the second part of your question, which is the best time to get ready was yesterday. The next best day is today, right? And and so just minor preparations in, in, in when I think of it, it's it's water, right? It's food. You know, you can get those emergency preparation meals and 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 whatever your, your budget allows, you know, just get yourself two weeks, two weeks is a really long time in a crisis. Um, you know, a month, you just kind of start stacking on to your, to your available time and putting more distance between if everything went to hell on a handbasket, I've got enough to survive two weeks, a month, three months, six months, a year, right? However, whatever it is that your mind will put, put you at ease, 
just to to put yourself in that preparation and and then anything beyond that is is um irrelevant because you can't do anything about it there is so much wasted energy and and emotion that people put into because we're told we got to he just said it exactly perfectly. They keep us distracted by 7,000 crises that are going on all the time. I don't even listen to that crap anymore. Like I don't, I don't watch TV. I don't, I, I, because at the end of the day, if there's a bomb going to go off the, you know, from Russia, I'm probably going to know about it. <laughs> you know, I'm probably going to hear about it from my neighbors. I'm probably going to be, you know, in the path of that bomb. So not worrying about it. And then the second thing. And I got this piece of advice back when I was getting in trouble and, uh, and facing some, some, um, you know, some unsavory repercussions for my earlier decisions in life is that once I, I, what I, once you, you figure out what you've made your bed, you've, you got to lay in it. But until that occurrence happens, whether you go to jail or whether there's an invasion or whatever it is, work your guts out on your business. I see you own one. Okay. Work your guts like because you live in a day and age right now, by the way, where nobody cares. Customer service is a new idea. You have an, 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 an unimaginable opportunity right now to focus, hyper-focus, get yourself whatever you can, take care of yourself, all that kind of stuff. But you have an, an immense opportunity that hasn't existed in the past for you to be able to acquire customers and to acquire business if you're good at what you do and work like there's no tomorrow because that's the thing that's going to be, you know, you want a bigger voice, you make more money, right? You want to have more freedom, you make more money with your business, right? You want to um, send your kids to better school, you make more money. Like those are the, those are the things and not money for money's sake, but money for service sake and money for outcome in, in ethical capitalism. You know, that's the, that's the way that we, that I think you solve those problems, but there's so much sickness. I know so many doctors, I've had a lot of them on my show. Um, you know, we've turned around a lot of doctor's offices and they tell me that one of the biggest um, challenges with people's health is the amount of things that they worry about, that regardless of how much they worry about them, they can't really do anything about it. You take care of your health, you get some good sleep, you drink good water, you eat good food, you know, and, and enjoy your life enjoy your people and have fun and laugh as much as you possibly can. Cause we never know, you know, we never ever know if, if this one's going to be our last minute, yeah, regardless, yeah. we may not even make it to the solar eclipse <laughs> and we'll have spent wasted time on worrying about a solar eclipse. And I'm like, oops, I died tomorrow. You know, <laughs> so well, that, that definitely is a, you know, a, a, a distraction. I mean, they, 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 your phone may cut off and, there may be some other problems, but it won't be from uh, solar eclipse. Uh, uh, it'll be for some from some more upgrades. Uh, but uh, I, here's what I would say, uh, Sophia, is prepare emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically. Uh, when 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 uh, I remember when when the phone cut off and I I was uh, at a restaurant and I did not know I was separated from my family. I did not know if um, if there was a directed. Uh, if there was an EMP, I, I was going to go see if if cars were moving, you know, um, or if there was a directed laser or what what was the issue, uh, and that everyone's cell phone was going out. But it did give even a dry run for what that would look like. And the truth of the matter is, in those moments, uh, you will be clawing to get back to to whoever you can, and and whoever you're with, that's who your foxhole buddies are. And if you're at in a restaurant, it's a bunch of strangers that you have to figure that out. But in my case, I would have literally hoofed it, started no matter how far away it was from the restaurant back to where they were to be with them so that I could obviously protect and do what needed to be done there. But um, uh, it, that happened and I wasn't there, but my mind was already playing through exactly how I would uh, have handled that. And, um, you know, th there's, there's, the the issue for to me after you personally prepare in those ways is if that happened while i was president i my 
wish and hope would be that every American would know no matter how bad, no matter, no matter what happens, we know President Roberts has it. We know it's going to be okay because he's the president. Uh, and, you know, even in my very first book in 2007 is when it came out, it's not what happens, it's how you handle it. Uh, and we just don't have a lot of leaders like that now, but uh, it it really doesn't matter what happens, uh, what comes at me, whether I'm prepared for it or not prepared for it. Do you remember how my entire presidency started? I mean, you can still Google and find out. I'm announcing, I'm in the rotunda of the Capitol, the state Capitol in West Virginia, and uh, it's there's people watching from an above balcony, and I'm down here in the rotunda, and um, and my wife was five months pregnant at the time, and she's standing like seven or eight feet behind me, and passes out in the middle of my whatever it was, fourteen or fifteen minute press conference announcing my run for president. She's won national and international beauty titles, beauty pageants. She's modeled in New York Fashion Week. She's been on six billboards in Times Square. I mean, she's she's got a resume, you know, of things. She's not like new to the runway, new to the spotlight and buckled her knees or, you know, crazy things like that. I mean, she's competent and yet she fainted, uh, even though we took every precaution known to man prior to that. And the Internet went nuts because they thought my reaction, it took me five seconds from the time it happened before I reached her to help her up. And they were like, unbelievable, five seconds, how, I can't believe he it took him five seconds. And of course, I'm thinking, A, it's very noisy in the rotunda. Uh, there are state troopers walking everywhere. She's seven or eight feet behind me. It's not like that's outside of your peripheral vision. And if I, if, if I start to see commotion, and I actually saw some on the opposite side, going that direction, which is what made me eventually, after a second, kind of turn just to try to get a better peripheral view. But my, my point to it is what everyone who was there thought it was handled just amazing. Because if whatever the commotion behind me was, if, if a president reacts to every little noise and every little news headline that comes across, we're going to be in wars. There's going to be nukes drop. I mean, it's bad. You don't want a reactive, no reactive person makes a good leader in business or in government. All they give you is whiplash. Ah, welcome to Congress. Uh, it's just nothing but a perpetual whiplash. And so, but as soon as I turn, knowing that I could redirect and keep going, if it wasn't anything, you know, that's how I handled that situation. And as president, I will take measured responses uh, as well. I'm not going to be a reactive president. I will assess the situation and then I will do absolutely whatever is the best thing to do. And in that case, I obviously was the first one to get to her, help her up. Um, and there was about five minutes where the Capitol staff, medical staff just tended to her. And we, th there was no press conference. Everybody's just sitting there watching and waiting to see what's going to happen. And in my mind, I'm going, do I go back up to the podium and say, okay, this is over before it started. Thank you. Um, or do I keep going? What do I do? And in that moment, I had to make that decision. Once she was stabilized and she was and she was good, um, then I had the peace of mind to be able to go and finish what we started. And so I think that gave the whole world uh, an immediate view of what a Roland Roberts for president would look like under crisis. Uh, and most people appreciate that, uh, that I'm just not going to go nuke a country because they said something. And so, boom, before I even get all the details, 
do something about it. Uh, or like I've said, you know, every a, a distracted president who's just interested in every shiny object. Oh, wait, we've had one of those. You know, I, I don't want to be that. Uh, so I just think America is not used to real leadership. They haven't seen it for so long. They don't even recognize it when they have it. But at least with Roland Roberts as president, when these things happen, Americans will be able to know, I may not be as prepared as I would like to be, but I know he will do what is right. So with that, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Jason, thank you so much for um, for being our guest tonight and what such great insights and, and just so generous with your time. Thank you for sharing. God bless you all. Have a great night. Thank you, brother.